Do something that gives you instant gratification on days where it's just like, well, well I didn't squat and maybe my deadlift kind of hurt. Just like, you know what? I'm going to finish the workout with some like high rep rows and I'm going to do some triceps pull downs and just like stuff that makes my arms feel pumped. Like, I got this right now. I know the rest of the stuff is kind of like a long term deposit, but this is what I want. This is payday right now. You're listening to Barbell Logic, brought to you by Barbell Logic Online Coaching, where each week we take a systematic walk through strength training and the refining power of voluntary hardship. Welcome to the Barbell Logic Podcast. I'm Nikki Sims. I'm joined here with Andrew Jackson. Hello. Matt Reynolds is not with us, so... Yes. It's going to be no, just quiet. We might actually just have some silence. <laughs> <laughs> it's a skill. It's a skill. It is. <laughs> His ability to talk endlessly is impressive. <laughs> you should start a podcast. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so Andrew and I were chatting again about training as we do, and we came to talking about how or what we do to enjoy training when we're not motivated. Right, which is timely because I think both of us are in a phase of training where it's uh, pretty uh, anticlimactic. A little bit, yeah. Like, what does that mean for you? I think it might mean different things for both of us, but what, what does that sure. mean? Sure, yeah. I mean, for different reasons, I think we're, we might be feeling that. But, um, you know, for me, it usually means uh, I'm alone in my garage listening to Radiohead <laughs> and... Uh, tr- <laughs> Trying to convince myself that squatting sounds like a good idea. No, but um, I mean, that's actually true 100%. But the reason that I'm in that mode right now is uh, I just finished up a three month training block, which was the tail end of, of really a six month phase of programming uh, where everything was going up um, while my body weight was going down. And so everything sort of like peaked about a week, a week or two ago. So now I'm kind of on the other side of that, which I have found throughout my lifting career or just training career in general that you, uh, or that I notice after I peak, whether it's for a competition or a training cycle, there's this phase for the next, you know, anywhere from three to six weeks or maybe even longer sometimes where I, it's, I just don't have the same excitement kind of, in, you know, built in because yeah, there's a, yeah, there's a crash. It's like, you know, the night after a big party or something, or, you know, that you've got several weeks of going into the gym, maybe attempting a PR, whether it's a rep PR or a, a one RM or three RM, whatever, which has this sort of like, you know, yeah, you had certain emotions fueling that. Yeah. And exactly. now you have different emotions that don't fuel it. They actually just kind of steal from it right yeah and and things that were easy for the last you know however long are now hard yeah like weights that you've hit for like triples and stuff you do for a single and you're like well i'm gonna die now (laughs) (laughs) right so that's kind of where where i'm at i'm like right on the other end of that or right at the beginning of that lull and that dip new plateau why are you what are you feeling right now for me, um, I've had this hip injury thing, not an injury, maybe just an overuse situation that we really try to play around with, with variations and frequency and loading. And honestly, the only thing that makes it feel better is not squatting. Mm-hmm. So I haven't been squatting, which I'm actually kind of okay with. I don't really love it, but like it, it has created a little bit of a void in my training where yeah. you know there's just a, a big lift that there isn't a big lift that day and you know it's kind of just like you have like a little bit of an existential crisis of like well what am i doing this for <laughs> <laughs> right and then um i actually just made the decision a, a couple of days ago but i hadn't really been training for a meet like there's nothing uh, really on the agenda but since things are opening back up, it looks like a competition will be happening. So it was kind of this weird phase of like, well, I can't squat. And for me, if I'm, you know, when you squat, you have like a different, you know, it feels like you can eat more, you know, there's this big training stimulus Mm -hmm. that provides other great things in your life. It's just like, 
well, when I can't squat, right. like my butt gets smaller and uh, I know it's vain, but it makes me sad. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. now I'm doing all this other dumb shit to fill that. <laughs> Yeah, that, I mean, that's interesting. It does, it has a ripple effect um, outside the gym too, right? Like the energy level that you have changes, the maybe right, you how you get your as diet. beat up, you don't feel yeah. as tired. Like you don't feel like you earned mm. stuff. Yeah, totally. So how far out is that meet now? Um, right calendar? now it's on the schedule for August 1st. So okay. a good amount of time to kind of switch gears mentally and get back into the the desire to do really heavy things. Like right now, it's just been kind of like light and fun. Mm-hmm. Well, I've had to make it fun because things are different. That's, I guess, what we're going to talk about today. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just curious, on that note alone, did you, did you notice an immediate change just putting something on the calendar? Did that, like, in well, itself Well, yeah. Like help? on Wednesday, I hadn't fully decided if I wanted to do it or not. And then it was like on Wednesday night, I was like, yeah, I'm going to do it. And I haven't trained again since then. So I'm going to train today right after we record this. And I think it'll give me a little different kind of fire. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that would be one of the first things that I would list as a a positive impact on training motivation is some sort of thing in the future that you're aiming at, whether it's a programming block um, or a competition in particular helps. Yeah. Sure. I've also found that that helps mitigate the crash a little bit. If you are doing a competition and you have the next one already planned out. Oh, that's a good idea. Um, yeah. What I, cause what I've noticed a lot of times is I come off the platform and there's things that I wish I could have done different or better. And so having that with a future state to aim at helps me kind of think about the, the lull as my opportunity to kind of plan and formulate all the regrets, (laughs) all the what now, all the regrets that you have. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think it's, I think what it's really effectively doing is like channeling the regrets into action. (laughs) Ah, That's that's my theory. That's good. I like that. That seems like a good (laughs) life lesson for us all. (laughs) 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 So there's something kind of interesting here. There's like, the phases of not enjoying or being motivated about training. And then there's mm-hmm. just like, you're in a great training block, but you just go into the gym one day and you're just like, man, I don't want, right. I don't like any of this, like, no thanks. So it's like we have right. long-term phases and then we just have short kind of phases. That's interesting. Right. Yeah. Right. And, and I think that um, in general, I've definitely shifted away. I think we talked a little bit about this on the last podcast we did that I used to earlier in my training career, try to fire myself up going into training, like motivation to train going into the session was a big mm. part of your how pre-hype. I approached training. Yeah. What was, yeah. just and out of curiosity, what was, what mm, did that entail? It started first thing in the morning on training day, I would start to visualize what it was that I was going to do that day. Um, and I remember even like on LP, it would be like over the weekend, I'd be thinking about that five pounds that I was going to add on Monday. And I'd be like constantly checking in with how my body feels. Like, do I think it's, am I going to be ready? Like how Especially many, the... how many dear diary entries would you make that day? <laughs> A mental dear diary would be like, <laughs> I mean, my brain gets into some pretty uh, intense cycles at times. <laughs> I'm and... sure some people can relate to that. I think we have some yeah. clients who can definitely relate to that. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I'd be spinning on that almost you know, kind of in the back of my mind all weekend and, you know, like waking up each morning wondering like, okay, how much did I recover? How do I need to eat more? Wow. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was pretty intense, but then the day of it'd be a lot of visualization throughout the day. And then that would sometimes cause like a physiological response of getting, uh, anxiety or adrenaline throughout the day. But then the actual like physical preparation was usually coffee on the drive. Like I'd either get it on the drive in or like I'd park away from the gym and walk to the gym and drink a coffee. The drive in, there was a specific series of songs that I would listen to. Wow. This is some serious (laughs) strategy. Yeah. It was pretty well mapped out. Like I had this, I had a Spotify playlist. It was called gym. And, uh, 
and it was you know the same like five songs i, I definitely to. don't have one of those mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> <laughs> um and then like you know going into it i had a pretty you know repetitive like a my warm-up routine was kind of the yeah. same i tried to do every time and cool so you really you spent up. a long time setting the stage yeah okay. which ultimately started to backfire because there would be these you 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 amp yourself so up so much like that so many times and it works for a while but it's not sustainable yeah you can't oh you can't make that amount of emotional deposit like every right. time you train right it's too much yeah I, I think it's a good skill to have and to be able to go there but if you're training over a long period of time it's um you not can't rely on it yeah 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 it also just left me you know, completely wiped out afterwards, you know, so it's just hard to integrate that into the day. Mm -hmm. You can't talk um, to your family. Like <laughs> you have to go update it on Instagram and then you, just, <laughs> you know, there's nothing left after that. You just have to eat and go to bed. <laughs> right. Right. But what, one of the things that I think has helped is to have it be a little bit more first grounded in, and this is something I got, I picked up from Atomic Habits, that mm. book by James Clear. When you're wanting to make, when you want to ingrain something as a habit, um, you know, it starts with an identity and then building a process around that identity. And so the big shift there was, um, and I, I mean, I mostly had that already of thinking of myself as a lifter, but, but what really helped, I think, standardize things or, or stabilize things was focusing more on the process of training rather than the outcome of whatever weight it was that I was going to lift. And the process of training can day. be really just simplified into going to the gym, doing an empty bar set, right? Sometimes yeah. it can be that diluted. Right, for sure. Yeah, I mean, definitely showing up. And, and that was something I, I found to be really useful when I was dealing with an injury. I had really bad knee tendonitis for like five years oh man to the point where like walking up and down stairs was like getting stabbed in the knee and so there were some days where i would have no idea how bad the pain was going to be so i couldn't hype myself up at all i couldn't count on any amount of weight being on the bar and to your point like just showing up touching the bar became the process and seeing what variant I could do. Could I pull from a block? You know, what version of a squat could I do? Could I do any squat? You know, just trying to find something that I could do on that day and do it the best I could became the process. Right. And so it's hard to, when you have to do stuff like that, it's rare that it's going to always feel rewarding. Right. Right. So when you have to spend 45 minutes trying to just find what variation you can do. It's just like, cool, yeah. I've just spent 45 minutes and now I know that I can do a six inch high pin squat. Neat. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> not <laughs> so super like, rewarding. Yeah, it's not rewarding, but you still get to shift your mindset to, well, I got to squat. Right. So what else, what, what would you do like during the rest of your training session to still make it feel like meaningful? Well, well I've actually picked up that, uh, I think a useful idea from you. Um, I think you phrased it as, uh, like add something that's immediately rewarding. Or... Yeah. Give, give, do something that gives you instant gratification. Instant gratification. That's the word I was looking for. Yeah. 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 Um, like on days where it's just like, well, well I didn't squat and maybe my deadlift kind of hurt. It's like, you know what? I'm going to finish the workout with some like high rep rows and I'm going to do some like triceps pull downs and just like stuff that makes my arms feel pumped. <laughs> Right. <laughs> like, I got this right now. I know the rest of the stuff is kind of like a long-term deposit, but this is what I want. This is payday right now. Right. Yeah. I mean, we, we tend to sort of talk about the difference. Well, we don't sort of. We talk about the difference between training and exercise, and exercise tends to be for that immediate gratification. Yeah. And we you know definitely want training to be the core uh, of our process, but when you are in the when you're in one of these lull periods or something's not, or the body's not feeling good. Yeah. Getting a little pump and channeling the inner Schwarzenegger yeah. uh, <laughs> <laughs> is I think very helpful to get a little bit of endorphin 
going and and um, just something yeah something right then and you know maybe i find during those times i like hate all of my lifting music mm. like all of my 300 long gym playlists is just like uh this is no, yeah. no thank you no thank you for any of this <laughs> so I'll, yeah, like, I'll sometimes i'll just listen to stuff i've never i never listened to or like just bop around until i'm just like oh finally this makes me feel not dead inside <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any uh, good examples of like what goes on the non-standard playlist? Well, just like yesterday. So earlier this week, I think it was earlier this week, one of my clients I've worked with for a long time, he's really awesome. He freaking squatted a 20 pound five rep max of 495. Like he had a 20 wow. pound PR. He squatted 495 for five and he like loves tool. And uh -huh. I remember watching that video and it was just like really awesome to watch. And I was just like... It was just such a great check-in because it was just like so emotional and yeah. you know tool was raging in the background i was like you know what i'm gonna listen to tool <laughs> so i listened nice. to tool for like my whole training session which is not something i usually listen to but i think i tried wow. like global funk the global funk playlist on spotify is really fun <laughs> 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 i tried that too but i like had some emotions so i like uh -huh. i think that's why i connected with tool <laughs> oh interesting <laughs> Yeah, tools are usually on my normal playing list. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> I think mine is uh, like techno music. Like I would never normally just put in like dance techno, but a lot of times I'll notice like if I'm just wanting to add energy, like a positive kind of upbeat energy, I'll put in these like dance songs. and Yeah, uh, so it seems like a good thing to do is just like try something a little bit different like you yeah. have to just like explore different ways to make you feel like oh i'm having fun right now or oh i'm feeling some sort of emotion that i want to feel while i'm here in the gym <laughs> yeah so it, what, what i find interesting uh, is that idea i think you brought it up uh, just from your own experience but it was also in that atomic habits book he talks about bringing uh reward into the present like what you're talking about there, like bundling something that feels good with something that you need to do. Um, and also bringing um, like a, um, uh, the opposite of a reward, like a, a cost into the present as well. Um, so for example, like having a training partner that you commit to showing up or doing a workout with, like if you bail on the workout, now you're kind of a jerk. So like, yeah. Do you really you can, want to be the training partner that bails? Yeah. So like sh setting up some pain that will happen if you don't do what it is that you're wanting to do is kind of another way you can trick yourself into. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Same thing. I know I hate to send, I hate to send Matt, like I didn't do my workout today. So I just never right. do that. <laughs> I just never right. skip training sessions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That accountability is that's yeah that's a right. big one mm -hmm. that's a big one is having a well and i think you know to maybe spend a minute on the value of having a coach yeah seems like we talked as about barbell logic we certainly believe in that and i think the combination of having accountability and also somebody who's been through that those lulls and can kind of help you see through to the other side or you know or remind you that you've been through those lulls because like I've been yeah. through those lulls. we've been lifting for like 10 years now like right. i haven't had amazing lifting for 10 years like right. there's been a lot of these peaks and valleys so it's just like i re i remember now like it's going to be fine you're okay right. it's going to be fine <laughs> things will be better how many, in three months <laughs> how many of your sessions would you say are punching the clock just sort of like you're showing up and you're you're kind of looking for ways to motivate oh, yourself. Lots of them. Just so yeah. many of them. Yeah. Like, would you say but, most? Oh gosh. I mean like there's punching the clock and it's like kind of just a drag and then there's yeah. punching clock and it's still like my fun thing to do during the day. Right. Oh man. I don't know. Like, I don't yeah. I have no idea. Do you have like a was, percentage? No. Uh, I would say most are in the category of punching the clock, but it's still the thing that feels good in the day. Like that, kind of helps ground my day. I look forward to doing it. I may not have a ton of excitement, but it's a good thing in the day. I would say that's probably somewhere around 60, 70%. I don't know, I'm guessing, like two thirds. And then 
the half of that last third is probably the really not fun days. Mm, the Radiohead days. The Radiohead <laughs> days. <laughs> <laughs> and then the the last, you know, the, the smaller half there is also the just like awesome, mm -hmm. blow the doors out, have a really good time. Dance party days, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I and, and I think that number seems to be shrinking as I have trained longer. <laughs> Not to be well. So actually, this is an interesting topic about it though. Like when I first started training, those those blowout days were what kind of kept me coming back. Right. You get to see your numbers go up every single time. Right. The, you get in the the. The thing that we created the process for was the instant gratification at the beginning. Right. And that is the hook. Yeah. That was one of the things I think psychologically that makes that first three to six months so addictive is you see the bar, you see the weight going up, you see the changes in your body, you see, you know, your skill improving mm -hmm. every session. And then you can usually stretch that out to every week. Yeah. So you still kind of get that hit at least once a week. Like, all right, I can look forward to Friday, you know, <laughs> and then maybe it's once a month. And then at some point you start expanding your PR grid. Yeah, right. You're like, like Tuesday PRs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> PRs at certain body weights. And... Fraction of a body weight. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so like you start playing kind of mental games like that and... Then what I've found more recently is that the training is less about that reward. Like those are nice, but I try to bring my attention more to the process of getting better, if that makes sense. And yeah. less about like the weight on the bar going up. Totally. You have even, to be kind of present though, to the process. Instead of like and detached always, from the outcome, yeah, always like yeah. oh, that, I've got that meat coming up. Like everything, this every single rep that I do in this training session is going to decide whether or not my meat is successful. Like yeah. that is exhausting, and that's going to make your emotional response to your to your meat more volatile. So now, even when I you are training for something, I think you do still have to like give yourself a little bit of a break or something. I think that works for me when I'm like training far away from a meet. I'm curious how you balance that. Like, is there a balance in your mind between that kind of embracing the process, letting go of the outcome versus you need to perform on a, on meet day. Like you have certain numbers that you want to hit on a specific day. Mm -hmm. Do you, is, do you have any way of, of balancing that or, it, or is it still about the process? It's still largely about the process, but I think, I think I just try and make reps even more and more perfect. Mm. And I almost will imagine the weight that I want to pull. I'm going to be pulling that like every time I train, you know? So mm. when I go in and deadlift 330 for reps or whatever, I'm going to be like, I start imagining 440. So I start to associate in that way the work that I'm doing now with the with how I want to perform. Not in the sense of like if you miss you're a failure, if you if you screw this up, you're going to have a bad meet, but it's just like trying to make it like more specific to what I'm going to be doing. So yeah. Like, like preparing myself to feel how I want to feel for meet day. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that totally makes sense. That one of the most transformative experiences for me from a training perspective was after I did my first competition, uh, it was a weightlifting competition and having that experience of only three attempts for each lift and kind of that, the difference that meant the difference mentally in being on the platform, the pressure of needing to hit the rep or you, or you potentially bomb out. Versus training where you can take as many shots as you want. Mm -hmm. And then carrying that back to training. I think it's kind of similar to what you're talking about. Like I, I remember after I did that competition, then I started to think about all of my heavy attempts as being what 
being being like trying to recreate that feeling of being on the platform or like having it be as important in terms of like miss versus make kind of visualizing that sense of pressure instead of it just being like oh, i'll just take a shot at this 12 and, tries whatever yeah yeah exactly you have to add that in yeah yeah it made training more meaningful even if the weight wasn't a pr attempt mm, mm-hmm because I knew that, and I guess this kind of connects back to that mastery and focusing on the process aspect of thing that I knew that I needed to make even the, the unexciting or the not exciting attempts as important as the big exciting ones. Okay. That's cool. So know. much training the brain. Man, something interesting I just thought of, I've noticed like if I have a bad batch of training and if I'm also like going through periods where I'm trying to make like a body composition change, which I don't do like really significant changes, but it's like, or if I'm not trying to make a change and I've somehow gotten a little fluffier, (laughs) it's Uh like if I'm fluffier than I want to be and if my training is going badly, that really sucks. Yeah. And so something that I've noticed is like, I like to have a, a lot of a lot more control over like my eating and my recovery and how I feel I look or how I just feel in my body so that when I do go through these little slumps it's not like everything is a total disaster okay interesting so focusing maybe on the things that you can control more yeah and like like how you eat and the the body that lifting gives you like I think Mm. that brings us all like a lot of joy if you do it right you know and if you have some control over it but I know and I've worked with lots of clients who are just like, they're trying to gain weight and then they, and then like maybe they get hurt. So let's just like, cool, cool. Yeah. Now I've added all this weight and then I can't do my lifting. It's like, that's right. kind of depressing because you have that body outside of the gym too. And you're just like, crap, I wanted this body <laughs> so that I could lift and now I can't lift. Yeah, definitely lived that one early on, put basically 80 pounds on wow. at my heaviest, almost 85 pounds actually. And that's right when I was also going through the, the knee stuff. And so here I was like looking, you said going down the stairs hurt, huh? <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> All 200 yeah. and what pounds? I got up to 285 pounds. Wow. And you're what now? Heaviest. 240. And super jacked. Yeah. <laughs> and like, if you got hurt now, it would be it, like, it would suck. Oh, if I got hurt, but then you just would like, be like fat Andrew walking pool. around, huffing down the stairs. <laughs> <laughs> Not that there's anything wrong with that. No. I needed, I enjoyed going through that phase as well. Yeah, it's good to do it, yeah. I hear what you're saying. Um, (laughs) uh, One of the things that came up for me when I was thinking about that was, you know, how do you deal with when, you know, there's like an external outside the gym stress or, you know, like people a lot of times will all see clients work blows up or shoot the last this year happens (laughs) Um, and training gets pretty low on the list of priorities you know what do you have any strategies or ways of keeping training in the in the i like refuse to let training drop in priorities yeah i'm like stubborn about it and maybe this is like health maybe it's a personality flaw like maybe i could have a much better life if i like wasn't so obsessed with training. <laughs> but like yeah i went through like some breakups and some moves and i like i've re- i really just decided that like training is going to be mine like uh-huh. no one is going to mess with that like i'm i'm mm-hmm. like really protective of it so it's like mm-hmm. i'm not gonna let some dude mess with my training that mm-hmm. i hate when i let that happen i'm not gonna let mm-hmm. some other person mess with my training like that's not okay like that is going to be mine because if i let someone else influence my training i just get really pissed Mm. so i just kind of make that decision of like you know what you're not going to ruin my day in the gym like this is my time (laughs) right and during that time if there are like fluctuations in performance Mm -hmm. do you do you just like let go of that and it goes back to hey i showed up i started warming up and we'll just I'll take it how it comes. Or, yeah, you kind of just have yeah. to be like, yeah, I had, yes, I'm not going to let them steal my training, but I'm also going to be like, yeah, there's some emotional weight on the bar. 
there's some emotional weight mm-hmm. on the bar today. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Maybe not sleeping so well. Like <laughs> things so are a little like, tough. Squat was two twenty five plus emo. Yeah, <laughs> sixty. So really, that I, was a two eighty five. Yeah, the two eighty five squat, and then I did all my deadlifts to Bon Iver, and that's okay. It's, it was still mine. <laughs> <laughs> But like, how yeah, I just you... don't want, I don't want it to be totally taken off the agenda for me. So that's how you manage it. What about for a client? Like what, what do you do when a client starts talking about, or like their compliance starts dipping? Ugh, man, and... it's tough. I try and find the one, I try and find the things that they like doing in the gym and I try and yeah. hear for the things that they don't like doing in the gym. So mm-hmm. like if I had someone doing box squats or something, I'd be like, how do you really feel about those box squats? Should we not do box squats for a little while? Or like, are you just, should we just take the RDL, the RDLs out, RDLs out for a minute? Like, how about that? Yeah. And kind of, I like to feel for the things that they do like doing. So yeah, I try and listen for that. And then I think it's good to not let them just disappear. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. you kind of have to be like, hey, are you going to train today? <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like there has to be someone, it's helpful when someone else cares about your training. Like yeah. we know we have to be personally responsible for it, but it is really nice when someone else cares how you're doing with your training. For even sure. Even when you can't seem to care about it because it's it's nice to have that kind of relationship. Yeah, I'm, I'm very similar, you know, personally uh, for my training. I, the big thing for me is that I don't make it a choice. I hear a lot of people talk about how there's that moment on their way home from work or, you know, there's some thing in their day where there's a fork in the road where they're either going to train or they're not. And they really struggle with, ah, you know, if I just go home and have a beer, if I get home and have a beer, I'm just, it's just not going to happen. And for me, I'm more kind of like, uh, I think what you've described. And again, maybe that's a personality flaw, but because I will, I have sacrificed a lot of things um, <laughs> by making that not a choice. Um, yeah. <laughs> but I felt, I feel like that's been valuable for training in the long run. Um, like I, I just do not relate to that decision mindset of it being like, oh, am I going to train today or not? It's just, it's like, it's on the calendar, like taking a shower or eating breakfast like, like it's not it's so funny i was talking to my sister about this just earlier today about like wanting to go exercise and it's just like i was giving her this advice and then i was like maybe i should use that advice for things that i hate doing like my yeah, taxes right. and like <laughs> right <laughs> and like just the other things that i'm horrible at doing regularly oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I certainly am not going to pretend like it is a um, uh, like a better than anybody else kind of a thing because yes, that comes at the price of many other things that I <laughs> deprioritize. For my clients, I'm also the same that I'll start with like eliminate the thing that is causing resistance or yeah. minimize the resistance. So maybe they've hit a stretch where you know grinding on heavy fives is just not feeling good. So let's try triples or doubles or maybe back down a little bit because I would rather them train than not. Yeah, for sure. Always. Or maybe instead of three lifts a day, we need to go to two. Mm -hmm. Or I found one client worked way better on one lift a day. So, you know, playing with the program structure so Man, that it fits I feel like if you there. can keep a client coming back with just one lift a day, I feel like whenever I do that, the client's just like, yeah, this isn't worth it anymore. <laughs> I, well, so for me, it's the, it's usually the home gym is huge, obviously, mm, mm-hmm. because it's, you, you don't have the logistics of getting to and from the gym. I don't think that works for somebody who's. Who's going to drive. Like, 30 minutes right. on each side. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that doesn't work. But if you got a home gym, and especially if you're able, well, especially right now, people are, a lot of people are working from home. Mm-hmm. So they're able to like, <laughs> I, had, I had one client <laughs> post a video last week. He still had his headset on. <laughs> like, <laughs> like he was in the middle of a conference call, stopped, didn't change, you know, hashtag team jeans, <laughs> hashtag Team microphone, uh, microphone. I don't know. <laughs> headset. Team headset, and busted out his 
one lift, back at it. So I don't know. Weave like, it in. And, and his compliance goes up. Like before that, he was on a three three day split and his compliance was struggling. So. Yeah. Okay. So you, you really look for that resistance factor. Yeah. Which I yeah. think we, we also do when we're having those tough times ourselves. It's just like, what's making me really hate this training session? What's making me really hate this training block? What's making me right. maybe not hate it, but it's just like, you know, you, where you've searched for motivation before you're not finding. Right. So find the thing that's like, the one little thing that might be holding you back from that so that you can, yep. you may not be motivated, but you can still enjoy your time. Right. And maybe that is yeah, just like it, less time in the gym. You know what? Right. I'll, motiv- I'll enjoy this time if I only have to be in there for bench press. I'm like, okay. Right. And, and I think you had talked about having the relationship with your client that where you can like have that conversation is really important. Um, because sometimes it's, I mean, you never know what it is. Like maybe they hate the box box squats or like I had one, one client who he kept skipping his deadlifts and we, I finally called him out on like, what is going on? He's like, well, my daughter train us naps at the same time that I was doing deadlifts. And so I don't know. I mean, it's maybe that sounds silly, but you know, it's just having that conversation of your life. Yeah. And then it's like, oh, okay, well we can, let's do floating deadlifts and now all of a sudden he's doing pulls again. Um, you know, you never know. It could be something really simple that you just find a little alternative. I, and I, I've also noticed this with clients more over time that, you know, some will defer to what is written in the program as if it's handed down on the stone tablets, you know, like this is, <laughs> don't don't go here andrew <laughs> <laughs> well i'm not saying just like make up your own thing but <laughs> like establish the relationship with your coach that you can you know bring stuff up that and at least give you know create the space for a conversation no like, I, know. I i totally i would rather some client i'd rather a client just be like hey I'd, i don't like these what else what can we do like what are what i hate this about it Please help. Right. Like that would be much better than just not. Doing or it. have the conversation ver- versus just leaving. Like I've had some yeah. people that just assumed that, well, this is all that I'm ever going to do. Right. But there's a lot of options out there. I just, we need to know it's not working. Yeah. And then, you know, this is one of the things with MED programming that I find to be mm. important is that, you know, as long as the weight is going up on the, on you know week over week and the bar speed looks okay i'm gonna keep going it's right? that, as long it's as that it's... copy and paste vibe it's just like okay here it is again <laughs> if, but if it's working it's working. But if it is working it's working it's great yeah but behind the scenes the lifters like you know and i've been there right like oh my god we're just gonna keep doing it and it keeps happening but Anyways, point being there, like having the conversation, if it's driving you crazy, is yeah. <laughs> better, better than just disappearing. Yes. No ghosting. Okay. So one thing you can do is within the training session, pick something that gives you instant gratification, something oh. that gives you like a pump or something that you know carries over well to a lift that you really enjoy doing something that's really easy to set up. Like if it takes forever to set up in your gym, you're probably not going to want to do that or like set a timer. You know, I am going to be in the gym for one hour and I will get as much done as I possibly can. I like that one. Yeah. Stuff like that. Um, well, what's, what's the other stuff that we talked about? Uh, we also talked about bringing the focus to the process, you know, focus on making the movement, more perfect or yeah. improved, uh, letting go of the outcome, you know, letting go of what the weight is today or maybe tomorrow and, and focus on the process to include, you know, like you said, making the process as small of a step as possible. Mm-hmm. Get into Make the, the process about showing up, warming up, and then go from there. Do it in your jeans, whatever. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> or or George. Or with your headset on. <laughs> Yeah, I think those are the big ones. Have a coach yeah. that can help you hold yourself accountable, uh, help you through those times, 
um, set targets and goals out in the future. That was another good one. Have a meet in mind that you can help bring to your mental game in the present. Yeah, get you something a little excited about. Sweet. Cool. And then listen to rando music. <laughs> yes. Spice up your playlist <laughs> with either Tool or Techno. <laughs> Or whatever's not on your current playlist. Whatever. Yeah, just something different. <laughs> <laughs> not Radiohead or Bon Iver. <laughs> Those are kind of nice to listen to when you're putting weights away, though. Yes. Or sometimes if you just want to be emo for a day, that's okay. Sometimes you cry and squat at the same time. <laughs> that has actually happened. <laughs> <laughs> Tear duct incontinent. All right. All well, right. Thank you for listening to Barbell Logic, and who knows, you might hear from us again. Sayonara. Bye.